Welcome to episode 6 of the Sutton Programme, hosted by G Rockache and sponsored by RS Grassroots. In today's episode, we'll be discussing avionics, so if you're interested in the role avionics play in rocket flight and the design features to make it all possible, then stay tuned. What are avionics? Avionics are all electronic systems on board a rocket and these work together to provide certain functionality. From monitoring the state of the rocket, updating flight parameters, air to ground communication and even recovery event management. This is all possible due to the onboard avionics. Avionics generally consist of a flight computer paired with a sensor suite, all assembled onto a PCB or printed circuit board, such as this one we have here. So here we are in front of the School of Engineering here at the University of Glasgow, home to Giga Rock Tree. Let's head down to the lab to discover more about avionics. While commercial flight computers do exist, such as this one here, the Stratolocket, the rest of the video will be focusing on our in-house flight computer constructed here at Giga Rock Tree. At the heart of a flight computer lies a microcontroller. A microcontroller is a small form factor computer equipped with processor cores, memory and input-output capabilities. Common commercial microcontrollers that you may have already heard of include the Raspberry Pi and Arduino boards. These contain extra functionality such as display output in the form of HDMI or network capabilities usually in the form of Ethernet or Wi-Fi. Arduinos, Raspberry Pis and the one we're using in our project here, the Tinsy, all provide all the hardware that you need on one single PCB to start making projects at home yourself. While a microcontroller is the brain of the flight computer, without additional peripherals such as sensors, it's unable to interact with the real world. Let's now run over some of the most common sensors used in rocketry applications. Here we have a basic schematic of the flight computer. As a quick reminder, here in the center, as we just mentioned, we have the microcontroller. Now the first sensor, GPS. Now we all, we've all heard of GPS. GPS locates the position of the rocket through triangulation through satellites. Unfortunately, GPS falls short when trying to work out the altitude of the rocket. This is where the barometer comes into play. A barometer calculates the ambient air pressure and using the rule whereby that air pressure decreases when the altitude increases, we can perform a quick calculation on board giving us the altitude. And the last of the three main sensors on board is this one right here, the IMU, or Inertial Measurement Unit. This device here, this uses accelerometers to measure the acceleration of the rocket, gyroscopes to measure the angular velocity of the rocket, and in our case, a magnetometer to measure the magnetic field relative to the Earth. Unfortunately, standalone, these sensors all have their shortcomings. However, combined together, we can calculate extremely accurate attitude and kinematics of a rocket. Finally, we have a couple more pieces of functionality on our flight computer. We have the SD card here, which we write to, extremely useful for post-flight analysis. We have our pyro channels down here. Now these uh, control our pyro events, such as parachute deployment. And lastly, a status LED. This is fantastic for elementary debugging. Don't worry, I hear you asking what the rest of the text on the diagram is. Now these are our communication protocols. There are main, two main types and there are two that we use. SPI, or CO Peripheral Interface, and ITC, Inter Integrated Circuit. And first, let's have a look at SPI. SPI uses a master-slave integration. First, the master, this is the MCU, and the two slaves are the GPS and the SD card. There are three main connections going to each device. The MESO, master in, slave out. MOSI, master out, slave in. A serial clock, and also a chip select to each slave. This just tells the microcontroller which device it's communicating with. And next we have ITC, which is my personal favorite. This uses two connections, a serial data and a serial clock. These are all connected on a single bus, with each slave device having its own unique address. The great benefit of ITC 
is that it allows multiple slave devices to be connected up just using one singular bus. To make the sensors that bit more useful, it's very common to transmit all the data, or parts of the data, to the ground during flight, used for in-flight analysis and tracking. As you'd expect, there are a host of different radio communication standards and frequencies to choose from. When making your decision, there are some important factors to consider. The range at which the data can be transmitted, the speed at which the data can be transmitted, and the power consumption of the transmitter. Our flight computer uses two RFM9 lower modules. The transmitter uses SPI to communicate to the microcontroller. The frequency is 433 MHz, which lies in the license free bands in the United Kingdom. We transmit flight data and GPS positions at different points in flight to help us with the recovery efforts. It goes without saying that all the electronics require a reliable power supply. Important factors to include when designing your power supply are the output currents and voltages, the capacity of the batteries, the size and weight of the batteries and also the reusability of the batteries. Are the batteries rechargeable? We use two 18650 batteries rated at 3.7 volts. When combining batteries, it's important to consider how you do it. Are we in series or are we in parallel? When in parallel, the current and capacity will double, while when you're in series, the voltage output will double. When adding these 3.7 volt light poles in series, the voltage will increase by 3.7 volts every time you add a battery, so in our case, 7.4 volts for two. If we were to connect these batteries in series, the voltage would be 7.4 volts, which exceeds the 3.3 to 5 volts range the microcontroller can take. In order to rectify this, a voltage regulator can be used. And now it's time for power channels. Power channels are outputs which connect to electronic matches which ignite power events. Power events include the explosion to launch a parachute, or even, in advanced cases, the ignition of a new stage. There are many different designs of power channels. Commonly, an electronic switch is used which sends a high current signal to the match when a signal applies. This switch is called a MOSFET. There are two types of MOSFETs, an N-type MOSFET and a P-type MOSFET. Here we have a diagram of an N-type MOSFET. All MOSFETs contain three connections, a gate, a source and a drain. With an N-type MOSFET, when a voltage which exceeds the gate threshold is applied to the gate, current can flow through the MOSFET. The opposite is true for a P-type. When the gate threshold is exceeded, current cannot flow through. So in our case, we use an N-type MOSFET, meaning that when the microcontroller wishes to activate a power event, it sends a high signal to the gate, exceeding the gate threshold, allowing current through, igniting the E-match. Using the MCU and the sensor suite outlined before, we can calculate the stage of the flight of the rocket. This will then be used to determine when we activate these power events. Further detail of how we use these power events with the recovery of our rockets will be discussed next time. That's it for today. Thank you very much to RS Grassroots for sponsoring today's video. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about today's topic, avionics, then head over to designspark.com where you can read an article to learn more. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.